Hey everybody, welcome to The Bottom Line. Michael Noland here, and tonight we're going to identify the top 30 bands in rock and roll. All right, so first of all, I want to make it clear how I made this list up. This list is made up of bands who owned their genres or subgenres of rock for the most part. There are a few exceptions, and we'll get into that later. Now, there are some worthy bands that deserve to be on this list that are not on this list tonight, and I'll explain why. Not only would they contest the subgenre that these other bands pretty much own, but there are also bands like Nirvana who are not on this list. Nirvana should be in the top 10 for sure just because of what they did to move rock and roll forward at that very critical time. Always an honorable mention, but their limited discography in my mind disqualifies them. They weren't around long enough. They were a shooting star gone in a heartbeat. All right, so for you longtime viewers, you know I have a list on my channels page, right? These are the 13 greatest bands of rock and roll. And of course, I consider them to exist in my imaginary Mount Rock Olympus, all right? These are the greatest bands, the greatest bands of their own subgenre. But more recently on my channel's page, I created another list, and these are the Olympian demigod bands. There is but a gossamer between these two lists, folks, and between them, they are 30 bands. And between them, they make up my list of the top 30 bands in rock. Now, I will identify my top three bands. Longtime viewers will already know that, right? And they will be listed at number three, number two, and number one. But none of these other bands are listed in any particular order. They just exist on this plane. And I'll let you guys discuss all of that in the comments, and then we'll get a consensus just like we always do. So if you disagree with my list and I have you pulling your hair out by its very roots, don't get angry. Leave a comment. Let us know what you think, because that's where the action is on this channel, always. All right, I'm just going to work my way backwards as it's listed on that page. Again, in no particular order except for the top three bands on this list. First up, I choose the Allman Brothers. Now, the Allman Brothers has got to be one of the greatest live performing bands that the world has ever known. Not only were they tight, but they did it with a ton of blues flavored, but not so much that they would let that trample the melody of their pieces. A larger band than I usually choose to follow, I at first didn't care for them. I mean, to me, their singles did not do this band justice because I judged them on those singles and I didn't get anything. As I've stated, I had an old bass player in one of my original bands who quit the band and went to play with an Allman Brothers tribute band. And I went out to watch him uh, practice one night and I was turned on immediately. I asked him, what album was he getting all of this stuff they had just performed? And he said, ah, that's the live album. I went out and got it. I was an immediate fan from that point on. And the Allman Brothers were a band that gave you great albums and great live performances always. Next up, again, in no particular order, U2. Now, viewers will know I have done my fair share of criticizing Bono, and I'm not a fan of their latest outing. I think it falls totally flat. And historically, this band has given us some real zombies for records, but they're on this list because of their better albums, at times ruling the world once the police were out of the way, and at other times coming up more as a joke, if you ask me. Now, I may not be a great fan of Bono the Man, 
but Bono the artist I have great respect for. I don't have to like somebody or agree with their lifestyle or agree with their spiritual concerns or whatever. If the music is there, I'm a fan. I mean, this band gave us the Unforgettable Fire, Joshua Tree, Octoon Baby, How to Dismantle a A-Bomb, and a couple of more. They're on this list. All right, next up, Uriah Heep. Longtime viewers will know I did a video on them. That was one of my biggest videos. I gotta tell you, I was amazed at the viewership on that video. And of course, I'm talking about a five to seven album range with them. For specific information on this band, take a look at my popular videos list. It's on there. And boy, I go into detail about this band. But you know what? Uriah Heep seemed to make a career of what another band on this list did, and that was doing several albums about wizards, fairies, ogres, sunrises in another realm. And the subgenre I would probably give them is my favorite storybook rock band. Okay, that leads us to my next choice, the Electric Light Orchestra. You know, I was a little bit late getting to them. I have to tell you, Telephone Line, the first single I heard, that turned me on. It even sounded like a Paul McCartney song with a George Harrison flavored vocal. I mean, I loved that song. I immediately got the album. I was hooked for life. Now, Electric Light Orchestra isn't just another Beatle clone band with a flavor of what the Beatles kind of sounded like, but it was all Jeff Lynn, and at first, several members of the band, and I'm gonna be getting into this fabulous band in the near future. All right, next band, the progenitors of Prague, the originators of poetry and pop, the fabulous, the wonderful, Moody Blues. You know, in the last couple of decades, it seems to me this band has been very, very underrated. Where the Beatles pretty much nailed using an orchestra to accompany a pop rock band, thanks George Martin, the Moody Blues rather, embraced these orchestras as part of the band to create many of their albums. Live, they would play with orchestras at time. Oh, the Red Rocks performance, fabulous. And a nerd in the band, Mike Pender and his fabulous Pendertron. Nobody had one of those. And with Justin Hayward getting on board after Denny Lane left the band, I gotta tell you, they not only had a pop singer, but they had a pop rock writer for sure. Spoken word never sounded so good. All right, representing acoustic rock at its best, of course, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Boy, you know, to me, this is a mushroom band. You know, the mushroom that shows up on your lawn and it's the first thing you notice in the morning. They sprung up almost overnight. Now, I'm speaking as an entity because this band was full of superstars. Each one of them coming from a very well-known and popular band at the time and somehow magically melding together in all oh, their voices. You know, it's their very first album that's my favorite. I know a lot of people choose Deja Vu, and I can understand that. That also includes uh, Young on it, and I love that album, but my favorite album is their first album, Ah, Guinevere. Oh, I love it. But you know, David, the Moody Blues beat it to using her as a feature in a rock song long ago. All right, now this next band I'm going to talk about is also like the Allman Brothers, but very stripped down. They are a trio of musicians, so you're not gonna get that full head-on sound, but for three people being on instruments, drums, guitar, which includes rhythm and lead, by the way, and bass, 
with a couple of lead vocalists, you couldn't imagine a more fuller sound. And of course, I'm talking about Grand Funk Railroad. One of Rock's best basses, he'd be in my top 20 for sure. His ability to nail what Don was doing on the drums, another great drummer, all right? Not in my top 10, but definitely in my top 20. And with Mark Farner, you know, fronting the group, well, kind of. Uh, Don would give him a run for his money every once in a while, and the two of them, I mean, either one of them could have been the lead vocalist for this band. They put out classic rock album after classic rock album, but they were just as well known as a live act. Grand Funk Railroad, welcome to the list. All right, next up is a pop rock group, okay? And I just recently covered what I thought of their albums and I ranked every single one of them. And of course, I'm talking about Paul McCartney and Wings. As a pop rock band, not even Fleetwood Mac outperformed them as far as the amount of hits over the years. But I saw this band and I saw them in their very best incarnation at the Cow Palace, man, Wings Over America, I was there, folks. And you know, in that last video, I talked about post-production on that live album. There wasn't a whole lot of post-production on that live album. They sounded that good that night. And you know what? My bass player went with me to that concert. And on our way back, as we crossed the Golden Gate Bridge, you know what he said? He said, well, you know, I'm mainly a Stones fan. I don't even care for the Beatles that much. But I gotta tell you, that man can rock. This is the one pop rock band that played nearly as loud as Led Zeppelin, I swear to God. All right, next up, a band steeped in tragedy and short-lived, but while they were out, they put out some of the greatest pop rock you've ever heard in your entire life, and I'm talking about Badfinger. Now, a friend of mine had the Magic Christian album, right? And I listened to that daily. The first album I bought from them, and I put it up on my wall. I actually put the album in an older jacket sleeve and put the album cover up on my wall. And if you've seen the album, you'll know why, no dice. God, I just wonder where this band would have gone if Pete had lived and of course Tom. Next up, a band with as many hits as Wings for sure and with even a more somber approach, a more emotive approach than what Paul would usually write for Wings. And I'm talking about Fleetwood Mac. You know, this band, first of all, has one of the greatest rhythm sections with John McVie and Mick Fleetwood as bass and drummer, right? And then with three of the greatest songwriters in pop rock, this band became something more than just uh, another band offering a silly love song, right? A band sometimes steeped in misery, and we all know who brought that on, don't we, Stevie? And yet rich in talent in so many ways. I've made videos on Lindsey Buckingham, Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks, all of that in the past, and of course, they're in my playlist. Next up, the band who has the second greatest rhythm section in rock and roll of course, I'm talking about The Who. Now, The Who is one of those bands where they don't have several writers offering cuts to kind of fill out an album. It was pretty much always up to Pete Townsend for that. Pete Townsend is a musical genius. I love what he's done even on some of his solo projects, but I gotta tell you, you know, he did fluctuate throughout the years, and so that's the only reason The Who don't make the top 13 that's soon coming up. But The Who, I saw them again at one of their most famous concerts, and the dynamics, and you know what? Keith Moon was plastered that night. He would eventually pass out, but up until the moment he did, him and John were locked in. That's the musician in me speaking there, folks. That's not just the fan. I'm telling you, they were locked in that night. What a dynamic duo. 
All right, next we turn our attention to Canada. Man, some great bands from Canada. And this band barely beating out the guess who, of course, Clatu. No, really, Clatu. Never heard of them? Well, all I can say is you have missed a ton. Back in the day, 1976, their first album got a lot of airplay and sold extremely well because there was this ridiculous rumor that they were the Beatles. Now I heard a commenter on a channel just recently say, well, you know, Klaatu went out and claimed they were the Beatles. Klaatu never did any such thing. They did want to keep their names anonymous. That was the mantra of the band. They named themselves after the main character from a classic science fiction film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. And they were always, always about the music. But with each and every subsequent album, especially when fans found out there was no way that they were the Beatles, the sales started dropping and we would only get five albums from them, just like the police, folks. But you know, these five albums, each and every one of them are gold. Hell, one of them's even a concept album, a space opera. Take that, Billy. All right, so next we're gonna cover my favorite grunge band of all time, Alice in Chains. You know, I first heard their EP. I consider it an album, folks, but it's an EP, Jar of Flies. And you know what? This band went from almost a hair band in their first album to a grunge act almost overnight. I mean, take a look at how the band looked in their first album. Man in a Box, oh, I love that cut. But back to Jar of Flies. Jar of Flies set a template another subgenre within a subgenre. This was acoustic grunge at its best, and they had the most time to explore all of its possibilities than any of the other bands, and they did so, so very, very well. My next band proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that you could get a kick-ass rockin' band coming straight from Dive Bar USA and still have a band that could give us some of our best pop hits in history, and I'm talking about the Doobie Brothers. Hell, I even like the Don't Be Brothers version of this band with Michael McDonald on board. And they're touring. If I get a chance, I want to see them just to see Michael McDonald and Tommy Johnson and hear both of them. Because you know what? My favorite Doobie out of all of them is Tommy Johnson. It was his songs that sold me, drove a nail to my heart at times. Even songs that celebrated, listened to the music. Ah, oh, good Lord, I love this band. A band with more lives than a cat, the Doobie Brothers. Okay, this band had a lot of competition. And uh, this band is from a subgenre that I kind of identify as horn based bands. I mean, with songs like Spinning Wheels and bands like Tower of Power, there were a lot to choose from, from this subgenre, but I chose Chicago. Do you know what drove me to this band was its guitar player. I gotta tell you, Terry Kath. I mean, this guy was so deadly fast. He had feel, he had it all. Tone, he was a tone chaser. And when you are mixing your guitar with not only bass, drums, and keyboards, but brass, baby, you got to know what you're doing. All right, my next band is a band that many would say is the first heavy metal band. And I'm talking Black Sabbath. Now I've talked about Black Sabbath so many times on this channel. I've talked about Mr. Riff himself, Tony Iommi. I've talked about Ozzy, even some on his uh, solo career, his latest album, a fantastic album, by the way. If you have not listened to that album, you really need to, folks. I love it. Patient 13. The wonderful, elusive sometimes lyrics from Geezer and the solid drumming. Ah, oh, good Lord, this band had it all. They all sold us with one note, by the way, folks. It's that first song off their first album. You hear the root note, 
then you hear its octave, the same note, only an octave higher, and then comes the dreaded devil note, the flatted fifth. Oh, they had me from that moment on. All right, there's my Olympian demigods of bands list for you. Ah, but now we're gonna get into the bands that inhabit Mount Rock Olympus itself. All right, so the first band on this list, okay, again, in no particular order, the band that brought us shock rock and theatrical rock all at once, the Alice Cooper Band. Now, there was a time when I would have just called them Alice Cooper, but Vince changed his name to Alice Cooper and has had a great career since the original band broke up. But it's the original band, it's those recordings that put them on this list. The original group had a magic. The way they blended their instruments together was sometimes eccentric, but always spot on no matter what they played, no matter what style they tried to imitate. And with Alice's lyrics and wicked sense of humor, they blossomed as almost a living entity. Theater at its finest, the Alice Cooper Band. All right, next up, a foursome. A great band unto itself, just musically speaking, but a band that had one member writing their material, a member who just recently got back his rights to his material, and who is touring this year, sometimes with Willie Nelson. Oh, I guess you guys have guessed by now. I'm talking about John Fogarty, and I'm talking about John Fogarty of Creedence, Clearwater Revival, not revisited. I wouldn't go see that band. I mean, talk about a band who actually created its own style with John laboring over lyrics. Uh, he even admits he kind of got the spark on Green River, which sounds like a swampy place you'd find deep down south, and it was a fishing spot that his father took him and Tom to occasionally. But at that point, he developed a mythos almost. And that there, you know, as far as I'm concerned, created the subgenre swamp rock. I love this band. All right, next up, a band I don't really love, but they're great. And when I say there's not a lot of love concerning this band, it's because a couple of their members, I wouldn't give a dime if he begged me for it. But as a unit, and with those two very members I just mentioned, they created greatness. And of course, I'm talking about the Eagles. Starting off as a foursome, later adding Don Felder, and that's when they really became interesting. And they treated him like crap, by the way, as well as treating Timothy B. Schmidt and Joe Walsh like crap, as far as I'm concerned. They still managed to hit winner after winner after winner on every single album they did or at least up to a point. You know, the latest incarnation of this band that's touring now, charging $3,000 plus tickets, of course, isn't the Eagles. They're not even close to what the Eagles were, and I wouldn't pay a penny to go see them. If their show was for free, I'd yawn and order a sandwich and go to the park. All right, now we're getting into the contenders for the top three spots of rock and roll at this point. And the first one is a band that not only had one of the greatest rhythm sections in rock, in other words, bass player, drummer combo, but had two instrumental virtuosos, one on keyboard, the other on guitar, baby, one of the greatest singers in rock and roll, and they all did it by ripping off Mozart and a lot of 18th century composers. I'm talking about Deep Purple. Now, a lot of that has to do with the riffing of John Lord and Richie Blackmore. Other than that, this is just a kick-ass rock band. I like several incarnations of this band, but I gotta tell you, it's the second incarnation, and most people would agree with that. And you know what? There's a reason why most people favor that incarnation. The band 
was that good. All right, you knew this band was coming. It couldn't help but be at the very tip top of the list. I mean, talk about cockroaches that survive a nuclear war. I'm talking about the Rolling Stones. Now, my favorite incarnation of the Rolling Stones is and shall always be the one that included Brian Jones. But you know what? It's that second incarnation where they stood on their own two feet without the Beatles to trip over, right? But that first incarnation, the fact this band started without a single songwriter in the whole group, and then they saw Lennon and McCartney literally write, I wanna be your man, in a corner, right in front of their eyes. But look how fast they developed as songwriters, even in that first incarnation. And you know what? Even with Ron coming along, they still put out some brilliant, brilliant albums. Of course, the Rolling Stones are gonna be on this freaking list. All right, next up, Rock from the Woodland, or the band that proved if you can play lead flute, you can be in a rock band. Yes, I'm talking about Ian Anderson and the wonderful Jethro Tull. This band managed through several incarnations as well to keep a sound going, and you have to give that to Ian Anderson as being the kind of progenitor of that sound. Martin Barr on guitar is fabulous. That's my favorite incarnation with the band, of course. I mean, I love Aqualung, Stormwatch, Crest of a Knave. I mean, these are just the highlights over a long period of time. I mean, this band, talk about longevity. I've only heard one cut on their upcoming album, and all I can say is color me impressed. Okay, so now we go to yet another subgenre, and of course, I'm talking about the band that I choose to represent what has become known as jazz rock. Now, there's a ton of bands that could be on this list, but without a doubt, the band that would be on this list would have something extra to offer. I would expect any band on this list in this subgenre to have a host of players that can play their instruments. Otherwise, it just ain't quite jazz, right? But not being a great jazz aficionado, not until I heard it within rock anyway, I gotta tell you, this band would also need something else to turn my attention to. And quirky lyrics is what did it. That and a man who was on the search of the one who stole his water. I'm talking Steely Dan. I mean, this band was based on a very tight songwriting partnership that offered direction. And you know, that's a good thing because members came in and out of the band as the traveling caravan of musicians visited them into the studio. But you know, this is a band that I love, absolutely adore every single one of their albums. But you know what? Here's a bonus for you. Listen to and read the lyrics as you're listening to The Royal Scam, Steely Dan's finest album, bar none. All right, so we're getting very high on the list now. You know, the last handful of bands and the remaining bands here that don't reach the top three could have easily been the third choice. So my next band choice is a band that I consider the perfect rock trio of all time. Not the greatest rock trio, not the most prolific rock trio, just merely the greatest, with one member primarily as their main songwriter. One of the most underrated guitarists on the planet, as well as one of the most underrated drummers on the planet, and bass players for that matter. A band that only put out five albums, folks. They were here and they were gone. And that's part of their mythos. I'm talking about the police. Oh my God. You know, when I first heard Roxanne, I was sent into another universe. Walking on the moon, I was sent into space. Ghost in the Machine, I felt I listened to that album inside the circuit board of a computer. Zenyata Mundata, don't know what that means, but what a cool title. 
and their very best album. And here's another thing, folks. Each one of their albums is progressively better, all right? And their first album is fantastic. But synchronicity is the one that did it for me. And of course, one of those synchronicities, telling of a mental breakdown through a monster story. Don't know quite where I'm coming from? You gotta listen to the song and you've gotta read the lyrics. It's fabulous. These guys ruled the world for as long as they were around. Thus, giving you two a chance to rule the roost. Because you know what? As far as I'm concerned, it was the police and then you two who held Rock's ground in that decade of single artists, the 80s. All right, well, you know what? The Moody Blues may have been the progenitors of Prague, but the greatest Prague rock band of all time is Yes. Oh my God, I can't even begin to tell you how I felt. My first listen to Yes was from the Fragile album in 1972. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I mean, this was instrumentation played by musicians at such a high level. Well, to tell you the truth, it kind of caused me to back off a bit. I was doubting that I would ever achieve the licks that I would hear from Steve on that band as a guitarist, and I knew I would never come close to Chris Squire on bass with the sweet and high and wondrous voice to tell us wondrous stories, John Anderson at the vocal helm and Rick Wakeman. I'm talking my favorite, you know, incarnation of Yes and the fabulous Bill Bruford. You had probably the very best. I'm talking about technically technically the very best rock band of all time. All right, so last of the contender bands, this and several before could have easily been in the number three spot. When I first saw this band, they were performing their second album. The second time I saw them, they were performing Night at the Opera, and of course, I'm talking about Queen Two. Those are two of the very best rock concerts that I've ever, ever seen in my life. And I'm talking about tightness. Paul McCartney and Wings had that. The Who, for a certain portion of that concert, had that. Leonard Skinner had that. But Queen, a trio, musically speaking, every once in a while, uh, Freddie would get on the piano and they'd even sound much more expansive but you know what with the rhythm section this band had and brian may at the guitar you know what i just read he was on some list as rock's greatest guitarist of all time i don't agree with that although he's on my list in the top 15 for freaking sure folks but this was the first tight band that i ever saw there was always a looseness to other bands, not quite like what it was on the record. This band sounded pretty much like the damned record. I immediately went out and purchased Queen 2, and then when Night of the Opera came out, I bought two tickets to take a friend as well, and we went to see them in this huge theater, and they played the whole album, as well as some of their other well-known hits. Uh, two of the greatest concerts I ever attended. All right, that leads us to the last remaining three bands. Who's on this list? And from this point on, folks, this is in order. My third favorite band of all time represents the psychedelic. And later, they weren't quite as known as being still a psychedelic band. And I more than beg to differ. I insist to differ. They have always kept psychedelia as their sound. They just changed it, folks. This band's discography is the tale of psychedelic rock. And of course, I'm talking about Pink Floyd. With albums, and I've mentioned this before, that belong in the Louvre, but it also gives us pause to think, especially when Roger Waters 
was capable of writing more reflective lyrics than he has recently. One of the greatest guitarists of all time and my favorite band member though, my favorite guy that I liked in the band, Richard Wright. Okay, so that gets us to the number two band and boy, talk about a gossamer between bands, but somebody had to fall to the number two spot, but guess what? Number one, you'll understand why. You see, this band ruled rock and roll for more than a decade. I'm talking about Led Zeppelin and talk about discography being part of my choice. They never made a bad album. They had nine studio albums, okay, whatever you wanna call Coda, all right? It was after uh, Bonzo's death, but I gotta tell you, they never made a bad album in their life and their top five albums, again, should be hanging in the freaking loo. My favorite guitarist of all time, my favorite bassist of all time, my favorite drummer of all time, my favorite singer of all time, and my second favorite band of all time, Led Zeppelin. Which leads us to the coveted number one spot. Gee, I wonder who it could be. Well, of course, one of the silliest band names in rock, the Beatles. You know, the amount of bands that came out with bug names later on. You can't keep up with them. Even a famous Gilligan's Island episode. Uh, the band that wound up being deserted on the island with them for a time was the Mosquitoes. Oh my goodness. But that's where the joke ends because the Beatles is also spelled with an A, not a double E, and that was John Lennon, one of the smartest men in the 20th century's entire idea. Led by Lennon at first, later taken a bit over by Paul, we had two co-equals and the two greatest songwriters of the 20th century. If this band had just relied on Lennon McCartney as two of the greatest singers, Paul, one of the greatest bass players, and John, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rhythm guitarist on the planet. I mean, his stuff is deceptively quite intricate at times, all right? And if they had just relied on that, they would have probably still been the number one band of all time but they had George Harrison. George Harrison at first was just their lead guitarist. But you know, when he started to see the royalties coming in due to Lennon and McCartney and uneven monies, George was that kind of guy, as spiritual as he was, he could be quite contrite when there was an S sign and a couple of slashes through it, folks. He had the audacity, oh, you know, I love George, and he had the best hair out of the Beatles as well. He thought to himself, well, if John and Paul can do it, oh my God, ah, can you imagine that? His wonderful, and it truly is wonderful, all things must pass. I mean, you've got a genius there that developed right in with the Beatles. With Ringo's drumming, a vastly underrated drummer, and I've made several videos on why that is so. This is a long video, so I'm not gonna spend any time there, but a great drummer with Ringo. This band buried all of the competition they all worshiped at their feet. All right, hey, listen, if you like the video tonight, by the way, please give it a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm identify the channel to a larger audience and the tribe grows as a result, of course. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, as of yet, it is easy. I've said it so many times, haven't I? All you have to do is hit that subscribe to the tribe button and then tap that top bell notification. That way you're notified of all my future videos and you're their brother and you are their sister. All I can say is I'm Michael Nolan. Together, you and I, we are the tribe and I'll see you in my next video.